The Passion of Jesus I Was Thinking of You Written by Miss Lorianne Matisse Read for you by Chiquito Joachim Crasto Scene 3 Setting En route to Jerusalem For the trial before Aeneas, Caiaphas, and the Sanhedrin Mark chapter 14 Verses 12 to 51. The world's thoughts of glory and my thoughts of glory are very different. The world looks at splendor, wealth, riches, and honor in this life. The path to the glory of God is filled with self sacrifice. A good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Greater love has no man than this, than he lay down his life for his friends. John chapter 15. Verse 13. I plan to lay down my life for my friends and my enemies, even those who would stab me in the back with betrayal, lay stripes upon me, strip me, beat me, and mock me. The character of a good shepherd who cares for his sheep is encapsulated in my word. Shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? I am the good shepherd. A good shepherd lays his life down for his sheep. John chapter 10 verse 11 I could see my father in heaven as I pondered my weighty decision. I could see him cheering me on to ultimate victory. I could feel my father's joy when he would greet me at the end of my race, just as he will receive you with everlasting joy at the end of your race. For the joy set before me I will endure the cross. What is my joy? You are my joy. Just as the Israelites smeared the lamb's blood on the posts and lintels of their doorways at the night of the Passover in Egypt, for you, I am the blood of the lamb spread over the doorway of your soul. As the angel of death swept through the land to smite the firstborn of every household, those in the dwellings covered in the blood of the Lamb were safe. The blood of the Lamb symbolized the redemption of all who were in the house. In the same way, my blood is poured out for you, so you can be saved from ultimate death. For now and forever, I am thinking of you. I knew that tonight, before the orange sun rose over the Jerusalem horizon for the day of preparation, my closest friends would run and hide. Even Peter would deny me three times. I knew that even my beloved chosen children of Abraham would gather in the morning and shout, Crucify him! My heart ached so deeply for my small band of eleven disciples, my precious students, my devoted followers. They were not much different from you, some buyers, some sellers some fishermen, some physicians, and even tax collectors, too. I recounted again the words that I had spoken to them at the Passover feast. A time is coming, I told them, when you will all fall away, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. Peter insisted quite adamantly, even if all fall away I will not. Yet, I said to Peter, even tonight, before the rooster crows three times, you will deny me. Never! I will never deny you! I will follow you to death! Peter insisted. I loved the persistent Peter. On him I would build my church. Not the outward church, but the inward church. My true church. The church of people's hearts. When two or three gather in my name, I am in the midst of them. The true church can take place in a building or in nature. It can have a name or not, but it is always a gathering of humble hearts who come together to worship me, Jesus, their Messiah. I had chosen the rock Peter. I knew what he would do tonight, but I also knew what he would do only five weeks from now, on the Feast of the Shavuot when he will be filled with supernatural power and proclaim my salvation on the steps of the temple. On this same day, also called Pentecost, 
he will proclaim the power and resurrection of the Messiah, me, Jesus of Nazareth. He will prophesy in tongues, a heavenly language I will give to him. His prophetic language of tongues will be heard by his fellow Jewish people in twenty-seven different dialects. This feast of Shavuot, the feast of the first fruits, will be fulfilled as the first fruits of the church are birthed that very day. But before this glorious day, Peter must endure his base emotions. He will face the human frailty of fear, which will cause his faith to buckle. As I am condemned to be crucified, Peter will deny me. It will be the most terrifying humiliation he has ever known. For a moment, he will feel separated from his very Lord, his God. He will feel lost and naked, without the hope of redemption and his most raw display of human nature, just as you may feel when you are ashamed of me, your God, your Lord, denying me in your darkest hour. If you are in darkness, call to me, and I will answer. I will illuminate your darkness, for I am the light of the world. Let me be the light of your world. Trust me in the darkness, for I am with you. When there is no light, take my hand. Let me lead you, for I am your Savior, your Messiah, the one for whom you have been waiting. I lay down my life for you as the good shepherd of your soul, for I was thinking of you, as I am thinking of you now, just as I thought of Peter, of James, of John, my disciples. These were not men with innate supernatural power. These were real Jewish men who had grown up in and around Jerusalem. They were hard-working men with friends and families. They attended the temple, celebrated Pesach and Purim, along with the other feasts of Israel. They did not comprehend that their rabbi Jesus, whom they had followed for the past three years, was certainly the Lamb of God to be slain to take away the sins of the world. They had walked closely with me. All had left friends, families, homes, and jobs to become my disciples. They had seen me raise the dead, heal the sick, make the lame to walk, and the blind to see. Even Peter had witnessed the healing of his mother after she had laid with fever for many days. At the touch of my hands, she caught up and began to cook for her son. My miracles poured out continually to those around me. Many were never written down, as they were too numerous to mention in a book. My heart bled for Peter, for John, for James, who had sat so close to my feet. They had witnessed my power on earth. How could they understand that my power would be fulfilled in my death on the cross? They had experienced the supernatural authority of their Messiah. The true bread had come down from heaven to give life to the world. The true bread had spent three years baking bread with them, as well as blessing the miraculous five loaves and two fish which fed the five thousand. I reminded them to be of good courage that I had overcome the world. John chapter 16, verse 33. But when the world turned against me, the night of my trial, I looked defeated. They felt defeated as well. Tonight, as they watched the events unfold in the Garden of Gethsemane, all seemed to be lost. Here were three years of their lives playing back before their eyes. Everything they had put their hope in for their future would be stripped, beaten, ridiculed, mocked and tried before Caiaphas, the high priest, who had advised the Jewish leaders that it would be good if one man died for the people. My disciples cowered in terror and fled immediately as the detachment of soldiers along with their commander and the leaders of the temple officials arrested me. One poor follower fled naked, having lost his robe. They grabbed him, but he escaped. I wanted him to escape. He was not the Lamb of God who would die this night. This pain and this glory would be mine and mine alone.
They bound my wrists. Not that they had to. I would have willingly gone with them. Peter and John now followed close behind me as we walked first to the house of Aeneas, the father-in-law of Caiaphas. The soldier who wrapped my wrists pulled my arms so hard and the ropes so tight that I might have dislocated my shoulder. He was used to a prisoner resisting arrest. Why is he not fighting? The soldier thought to himself. I was thinking of him, a soldier who was simply doing his duty. How could he know he held the hands of God's own Son, the Anointed, the Christ? Even if he knew I was the chosen one of the Jewish people, it would not have mattered to him. He was not Jewish. He knew nothing of the temple, the laws, or the Torah. He had to deal with the Jewish people on a daily basis, since Rome was a supreme governmental power at the time. To him, the Passover only meant that the streets of Jerusalem would be overcrowded with foreigners who had come from all directions to celebrate the feast. There would also be holy men in their long robes, reciting memorized prayers. The priests would be chanting blessings as lambs were slaughtered. These rites and rituals meant nothing to this soldier. He was just doing his job. He did not know I was the Lamb of God to take away the sins of the world as well as his sins, even those of his family. He was a young man, only twenty-one, but he had been married already three years. He had a family to feed and a demanding young wife who dreamt of going to Rome. He hoped one day he would be promoted to captain or centurion. I, to him, was simply an order to be carried out, a duty to be followed. Yet there was something strange about the way he looked at me. He may have wondered why he had to arrest such a mild-mannered man. He may have felt uneasy tethering me and leading me down the dusty road like a common criminal. He did not relish this responsibility of arresting a lowly rabbi. He could not wait to release me to the priests. To him, the long walk seemed to last an eternity. How could he have known? The one whom he was holding in his taut grasp held the keys to hell and death. How could he have known that before Abraham was I am? He may have thought I was a religious fraud. He may not have thought about me at all. But all the while I was thinking about him, just as I am thinking of you now. One day, you might bind me in your chains of judgment, or take me away to be tried in your court of calculated opinions, or perhaps the day comes when what other people think of me causes you to act in a way you would not ordinarily act, because, like the soldier, you are just doing your job. Perhaps you never question their opinions. Perhaps you do question them but do not want to make any waves or cause any problems. By questioning, you might lose your position in the government, society, or your position in the Roman legion, for that matter. I wondered if this soldier knew me. Would he release me? Perhaps. But that would not happen now. No. Tonight he would carry out his duty. For it is my destiny to be brought before the Sanhedrin. It is for this reason I must die. For you, for the soldier, for ignorance, for defiance, for compliance, I must die, for I was thinking of you just as I am thinking of you now. I love you. You can find forgiveness. Don't turn away. Look to me, the Lamb of God. I came for my own, the lost sheep of Israel. They did not receive me. As many as received me, I give the right to be sons and daughters of God, just as this soldier could become my son if he humbled himself before me. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. John the Baptist had proclaimed when he baptized me. At that moment a dove descended from heaven, 
and my father's voice spoke also from heaven. This is my son. I am very pleased with him. Matthew chapter 3 verse 17 The light shone in the darkness, but the darkness did not comprehend the light. The light reveals men's and women's hearts, whether they are good or evil. Yahweh dwells with those who are of a contrite and humble spirit. Isaiah chapter 57 verse 15 Even though the priests of the Torah had studied about me, in Isaiah, Zechariah, and the Psalms, they did not recognize me. Some of the Jewish leaders had come to me in secret, and in the night, Joseph of Arimathea, who would donate his tomb to me, was one of them. How curious these teachers were to learn about me! How open were they to the truth! How pure their hearts were as they composed their questions! How can one be born again? How can a man re-enter his mother's womb? Nicodemus asked. He was one of the priests who humbly addressed me as a teacher, Rabbi. Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Knowing that I had come from God, he was indeed on the edge of the most crucial truth in the universe. I answered, to enter the kingdom of God, one must be born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to me, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? I answered, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh and that which is born of the Spirit is Spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. John chapter 3 verse 5 To be born of the flesh is to be born into sin. The world is fallen and perverse held captive to the sin of Adam. To be born of the Spirit is to have one's eyes open, to understand the mystery of the Messiah. Here I was, the Anointed One, Emmanuel, the Mighty God, the Prince of Peace, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the one to whom the scepter of Shiloh was passed. But in the Jewish leaders' jots and tittles at the dotting of the eyes, Lost in the ordinances and the extensive rabbinical laws, where they exacted their labors as they argued each point, they could not recognize the very truth they had been looking for. The Son of God stood before them. The grace of Adonai gloried in their midst. In their zeal, they had searched the scriptures, but they did not come to me. How could they not know me? I loved each one, how I hoped they would recognize me, but alas, a hard heart has blind eyes. O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how you stone those who are sent to you! After tonight, your temple will be left to you desolate. How I longed to gather you as a hen gathers her chicks! Matthew chapter 23, verse 37 these words I will speak, as I stagger up the hill to Golgotha in the morning, bloody, beaten, and worn. Why didn't they see the compassion in my eyes? Couldn't they tell I was not putting up a fight? What were they so afraid of? Often those who are most afraid are the ones who accuse and condemn others. So, for these priests, or for anyone who would ever condemn an innocent man to die, I must die in their place, in order to make a way of salvation for anyone who calls upon my name. If it is you, if you have stood in the judgment seat for someone in your own life, if you have condemned someone to die, or if you are trapped under the weight of your own law to the point you cannot see your Messiah, then it is for you I must die. When you have exacted your labors until your heart is stone cold, 
you need to know you are still loved and can be forgiven if you call upon me. You can find forgiveness in me. It was for my misguided religious rulers I had to die, heading me to my execution and for you. For after all, I was thinking of you, as I am thinking of you now. Eve's Memoirs and Other Books and Art by Laurie Matisse, available at www.evesmemoirs.com www.lauriematisse.com www.mysticcenter.com Laurie's blog, Weaving Light lauriematisseblog.wordpress.com For information on Eve the Musical, contact lauriematisse at gmail.com End Times Info www.mysticcenter.com www.calculatingthelast7.com Support the work of translating this book into other languages https colon two forward slashes www.patreon.com forward slash Laurie Matisse